that it's some other people show up. Beloved Lord, fill our hearts full of love for thee. Thou hast finished with fear and with doubt, standing firm in the vision of God, refuge to all who have cast fame, fortune, and friends away. Without question thou shelterest us, and the world's great sea in its wrath seems shrunk to the puddle that fills a hoofprint in the clay. Om Hari Om. Jai, 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 all the great incarnations and teachers. So Heidi, why don't you just read, could you wait till four? And we'll see if anybody else shows up. And if they don't, we'll just charge on ahead and and finish up Rabia or whatever we do tonight. Uh, we're about to finish her up, aren't we? Yep. Okay. Could you wait till four? My understanding used to be like a stream that easily described all along the banks as its keen moved through the world. When I entered God, my vision became like his. It flooded out over existence, I knew no limits. The future I can now see with as much certainty as the past. If I stretch my arms its full length, I could caress any creature in this universe. And Rabia does not exaggerate. Thus going to bed one night, I knew a thief would be breaking in at 3 a.m. So I wrote a note and put it on my door that said, could you wait till four? For the passions and prayers usually start to wane by then. <laughs> could you wait till four? My understanding used to be like a stream that easily described all along the bank as its keen moved through the world. When I entered God, my vision became like his. It flooded out over existence. I knew no limits. The future I can now see with as much certainty as the past. If I stretched my arms, if I stretched my arm its full length, I could caress any creature in this universe. And Rabia does not exaggerate. Thus, going to bed one night, I knew a thief would be breaking in at 3 a.m. So I wrote a note and put it on my door that said, could you wait till four? For the passion and prayer usually starts to wane by then. <laughs> a, a little background for this poem. It is said in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras that one who attains as she said, she puts it as I entered God. That is to say, when you become liberated from that, uh, those limitations that she describes in the first couple of stanzas, when you are free from those, what happens is you become omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. And that's exactly what she's describing here, that uh, she has become that. Uh, and Rabia does not exaggerate. So we hear this from others in the, in this, we'll hear the same, this business about uh, being omnipresent from, from Meister Eckhart as well. So, then there's just this little funny business that she puts at the end that Swayam gave us a, an interesting interpretation of last week. Um, 
So this is just one of those poems that uh, speaks of what happens if you attain the state where it flooded out over existence. I knew no limits. Omnipotence, omnipresence, omniscience. Anything else from anyone? I see that some other people have shown up. How nice. Nira, good to see you, your name there. Michele. Hi. <clears throat> hey. Anything else from, from anyone about this poem before we go on to the next one? Would you review for us, Swayam, what you said about the last couple of stanzas last week, if you recall? If you don't, that's fine too. No, I do recall. Um, one thing we were discussing was that because, um, you know, uh, these saints mean what they say and when she said that she can see the future as with as much certainty in the past, one interpretation would be that she knew that physically a thief would be breaking in and so she wanted to put a note, wait till four, assuming that she was praying um, at that hour and by four that her, the passion would start waning. My interpretation was that um, she was meditating even before that. And just like when we meditate, all these thoughts come as thieves to, um, to drag us away from the from the passion in prayers, she wanted to put a note to say to her thoughts, okay, could you wait till four before you intrude yeah. so I can continue my um, prayers with passion. I, I think that Rabia herself would like that interpretation. I think that she would quite agree that, uh, that she would uh, post a note in her mind, so to speak, saying, hey, leave me alone till four o'clock. You know, and I, I like the word passion, the sense of passion. Yes. And, you know, because it, it does require a certain amount of earnestness for the truth, or we so it can easily fall back into describing, like she mentions in the first stanza. Right. You know, you really, be, and I, you notice it on a Monday too, you know, you had a really <laughs> relaxing weekend. You know, I we went to visit some friends in Indiana, you know, beautiful garden, a yard, the sunshine, right? A beautiful day, the dogs running in the green field, completely open, you know, and the grass is, we've had a lot of rain. So the, the grass is just this beautiful, deep green, you know, and their little bodies, running through, you know, and it's very easy to, to, uh, to feel that connection, right? To feel um, in her, you know, in, in her prayer, her passion for her prayers, feeling right. very um, entering God, right? But then Monday comes, right? And then it's like, oh, and your coworkers telling you about this and your boss popped in, you know, and we get back into the descriptions, right? And we go, oh, I don't like that. Oh, now I'm, I've lost it. Oh, whoopsie doodle. You know, I had it. It's gone. I'm doing it wrong. You know, I've got to, you know, and it be, just becomes more description, more description. And then we're back in the first stanza. That's that's why the Zen saying, before illumination, chop wood, carry water. After illumination, chop wood, carry water. <laughs> you know, Monday comes, chop wood, carry water. Yep, no two ways about it. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> well, Swayam, would you be so kind as to read a lover who wants to be near? Or wants her lover near? Lovers near? Yes, absolutely. Um, a lover who wants his lovers 
near. He is sweet that way, trying to coax the world to dance. Look how the wind holds the trees in its hands, helping them to sway. Look how the sky takes the fields and the oceans and our bodies in its arms and moves all beings towards his lips. God must be hungry for us. Why is he not also a lover who wants his lover's tear? Beauty is my teacher, helping me to know he cares for me. A lover who wants his lovers near. He is sweet that way, trying to coax the world to dance. Look how the wind holds the trees in its hands, helping them to sway. Look how the sky takes the fields and the oceans and our bodies in its arms and moves all beings towards his lips. God must be hungry for us. Why is he not also a lover who wants his lovers near? Beauty is my teacher, helping me to know he cares for me. I think it's interesting that just what Jeffrey was saying about the last poem, about beauty, beauty is my teacher. It can really bring us <clears throat> that uh, sense of transcendence. It just lifts us up out of ourselves, particularly nature's beauty. And sometimes it does that without us actually even thinking about it or focusing on it. Yeah, I could be sitting in my living room with my mind on hundred things, but I look out the window and the tree is swaying and it suddenly just takes me to a different zone. And yes. likewise, we go out and, you know, look at the sky and there's just something about it that um, automatically just lifts um, us up, even if it's a cloudy day. <laughs> Yes. Well, you know, all of our limits are in our left mind. This is what we're taught even by neuroanatomists like Jill Bolte Taylor. All of our limitations, all of our descriptions of reality that limit our ordinary, limit us to our ordinary awareness, our Monday awareness, as Jeffrey put it. They all exist in the left mind. She calls them neural loops. They get touched and they just run through their little routine. And there's the limitation. Whereas the right mind or the heart knows no limitations. So when we, and that's what seems to lift us out when something touches us in that way. Anything else from anyone? Yeah, I Ooh. didn't quite get the um, God must get hungry for us. Why is he not also a lover who wants his lovers near? Um, I can't wrap my um, mind around that one. Anybody have any idea what, you know, what is being said? I had equal confusion. <laughs> I also, you know, I puzzled over that, you know, and I'm not sure I, I reached uh, something that, that I, uh, you know, understood. Yeah, and the only thing I would say about that is that is the name of the poem. You know um, how it ends. God must get angry for us. Must get angry for us. Excuse me. Why is he not always a lover who wants his lovers near? Now, a lover who wants his lovers. I mean, that is the name of the poem. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I'm not. I don't have a real answer other than to point that out. Well, this is this is 
it just seems to me that she's pointing toward the duality. You know, there seems to be this, it's like St. Teresa of Avila, Avila says, St. Teresa of Avila says, it's only in us that God gets so lost that he asks questions. So God must get hungry for us. But then there's this other aspect of separation. Why is he also not a lover who wants his lovers near? If, if we all became absorbed in God like, like Rabia, the game would be over. That's the only thing I can think of it. That's the only thing I can think. If we all became like Rabia, then the game would be over. There would be no more universe. We'd all be absorbed. We would have all entered God. So there's this separation, this mundiness, as Jeffrey points out. You know, on the weekend, there was this lovely sense of transcendence, and then there, we're back into the duality. I think, too, this idea of nearness, that we could get to a certain point, we could be near God <clears throat> or love or the universe, uh, but that doesn't make sense if there's just one, there's no other for there to be a nearness. It's more intimate than near. It's, yeah. it is, it is what's shining forth. Like you can't get near what is essentially what you are, right? You can't, it's closer than close. I think other poems point to this, this more intimate than your own breath, your own skin, your, it's, it's what's shining, shining forth of what is. You can't get closer to, to, to what is, to now, try as you might. Yes. Well, in, in one of the Upanishads, it describes the, uh, the divine presence as nearer than the nearmost, farther than the farmost. And I think it's interesting, she ends the poem you know, answering her question, you know, he's hungry for us, but somehow he doesn't draw us all near. And then she says, beauty is my teacher, helping me to know he cares for me. Um, Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. I think the first uh, few lines actually connect quite well with that, because he says, he is sweet that way, trying to coax the world to dance. Uh, if he draws them too close, um, too near, then there won't be any space to dance. Well, not only that, but in the time of Rabia, dancing was not what we think of as like these days, where the dancers hold one another, ballroom dancing, that kind of thing. It was much more an individual thing, or like the Sufis do, that particular kind of dance that they do where they spin, mm -hmm. which is produces a kind of transcendence. This is the, this is the wonder of, of these poems and how, how each of us can hear what we hear in them and enjoy them from our own perspective. And it needn't be any exclusivity. Each one is coming from our uniqueness and our infinitude. Brother Shankara? Yes, dear. Yeah, yes, I was reminded of Lord Krishna and the gopis, you know, they were dancing around him, each one of them doing the, her own dance. Yes. 
Lord Krishna. And he was dancing with each one of them. Yes. Yes. But not, you know, not close. That isn't the way they danced. Mm -hmm. So, yes, beautiful. Thank you, Nira. What, uh, what, uh, what is Nira is talking about is something called the Rasa Lila, the great mm -hmm. play of Krishna, the great sweet play of Krishna in Vrindavan, when he was spirited away as a child so that a, an evil king wouldn't kill him. He was spirited away <clears throat> from the capital city to the uh, to this little uh, dairying village of Vrindavan. And because of who he was, all of the uh, cow herds and cow girls, uh, cow maids, all fell in love with him. You know, but the gopis especially just went head over heels for him. And uh, though he was just a boy, you know, he, uh, he inspired great love in them. And so it was called the sweet play, uh, the Rasa Leela. That's what uh, Nero was referring to. Also, um, I know um, there are other poems waiting for us, but the choice of the word hungry is something I need to think about. Why would she use God must get hungry for us? Yeah. Well, that's, that is worth pondering. And I like that second stanza <clears throat> where she says, look how the wind holds the trees in its hands. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, just the way, just how they say that. I mean, whoever thinks, who thinks like that? <laughs> I mean, well, you know, <clears throat> Father Thomas Keating, his experience of transcendence, his illumination, if you will, had to do with exactly that. He was standing, he'd gone on retreat. And one afternoon after days on retreat, he was walking, and the wind was blowing the trees. And suddenly, he understood the term, not a leaf moves, but by the will of God. Yeah. And it just suddenly that, you know, that's the way it seems to work. Something turns the key in the lock. And I mean, the next I'll, thing, hmm? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, what were you gonna say? No, go ahead, finish, and then I'll say. And it, it, suddenly he just found himself dancing in ecstasy, understanding that just like the leaves on the tree, he was being moved and everything about his movements and thoughts and so on was by the will of God. And so he lost outer consciousness and uh, went into that spiritual ecstasy that in Sanskrit is called Samadhi. And uh, when he returned, he was transformed and he became the the Father Thomas Keating of the last chapter of his life. There was a young man here this morning, Aaron's uncle, who lives in Austin. Uh, and uh, there's a church there that Mark has been going to uh, for some years. And about three years before his death, apparently, Father Thomas Keating came and spoke there. And it, it, it had the effect of lifting them all up. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah. But I see that that stanza there as very caressing, you know, like yes. holding, um, the wind holding the tree, you know, in its hands um, and helping them to sway. That's yeah. part of the dance, too, that. You oh, know, that swaying is part of the dance, no doubt. Word, word 
the world to dance. Yeah, well said. I just, I just like that stance. I just, that's just so beautiful. It is. You know, and the wind blows, right? The wind blows the way the wind blows and the trees move the way the trees move. There's a real ease to it. It's very natural. The, the wind isn't trying to achieve uh, blowing of tree. You know, it, no. it, the wind blows where the wind blows. And I think that's just such a lovely way the wind, to the wind bloweth, The wind bloweth where it listeth. Yeah, and then that beauty is her teacher, as she says. It's a great comfort in that. There's a great comfort. Yes. I mean, like Swayam was saying, just you can be inside and still see the leaves blowing uh, on the trees. Yes. And feel something. And I mean, we just had, we were talking about the weather when some of us first came on. I mean, it was really blustery. Um, I think even Friday. Friday and Saturday, and we have these huge oak trees in our backyard, and just sitting there um, out of the wind and just looking through the window, it was just, I mean, my husband and I were just sat there and we just looked for quite some time at the beauty of the leaves and the trees. I mean, they were really swaying, and it was, um, I'll look at that a little differently now when I see the wind blow, maybe after reading this poem, you know. But Beauty, um, beauty will be your teacher, yes. It is. I mean, <clears throat> I was in nature yesterday on in a, in a nature walk and, um, you know, seeing all the green. It's very green here, too. You know, we've not had a lot of rain, but um, I was at a local park with a waterfall and we had a little picnic on a rock, you know, and, um, the green trees. I mean, they were just oh, all around there. Yeah. Henderson Park there. Any of those, you, anybody knows that locally here. Um, yeah. And, uh, but it was just, it was just so beautiful, you know, but, uh, but yeah, that other day when the wind was just blowing so hard, it was just, um, just something, just, to, it really moved you looking at it, you know, it really did. Yes. So, well, it obviously moved Rabia too. <laughs> and she reaches out and touches us over the centuries. Jeffrey, would you like to read Troublemakers? Oh, certainly. Troublemakers. Since no one really knows anything about God, those who think they do are just troublemakers. <laughs> troublemakers since no one really knows anything about god those who think they do are just troublemakers <laughs> yeah there is something to this un this not knowing right because it's this this unknowing this this inability to, to know it in the way we're so used to knowing with our brain, knowing yeah. something as limited, you know? Even when we say tree, I have a tree in front of my house, that tree is constantly changing. Yes. I mean, I think just tree, I think it's the same tree from last year that was in front of my balcony, but it isn't. It's every leaf is different. Every old leaf had fallen off. There was a whole new fresh patch I'd never seen these leaves and they've never existed ever, these leaves, you know, and here they are in, in front of my eyes, right? And very directly, but we could just see that tree and go, oh, tree, you know, it's just it's this, the same tree that I was there last summer, no big deal, right? Or you could notice that actually that's not the case at all, you know? Yep. Thank you. And beauty being your teacher too. Uh, and for Rabia, you know how close her relationship is with God. For her to say that, I mean, clearly nobody knows everything, but um, she knows a lot about God. So I have really? to think she's a little bit of a troublemaker too, right? <laughs> no. Or not, or no, this is this is this is once again these paradoxes that are that are 
very much a part of the duality in which we live and the, the language that we try to communicate in. Since no one really knows anything about God. And I think she sincerely means that, even though she has entered God, as Jeffrey pointed out, it's not a thing of the brain anymore. It's, it's something of the heart. And the heart does not speak in language. The heart speaks to us in feelings and images. No, and we go ahead, Jeffrey. Sorry, I was going to say we don't really know about anything. You could re replace the word uh, and put apple there, since no one really knows anything about an apple. Yeah, we can describe the apple. We could say it's red. We can say it, but well, what's red? Well, red is uh oh it's uh sweet oh what's sweet well it's like when your tongue and uh oh where did it come <laughs> from oh i there was a seed and we you know you know, you keep going oh what's a seed oh it's uh like stored energy oh what's stored energy oh um like movement oh what's movement like a like a dance oh it's so an apple is a dance right and god is a dance and pillows are dances is it all when you get back when you keep subtracting, right? You 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 end and begin with mystery, right? It, it's it's uh, and and we do it with, but it, but an apple would work too, right? I mean, because it's all in a way God. Yes, and and you were just describing mindfulness meditation, you know. Boy, we just go from this back to this, back to this, back to this, back to this, yeah, it's and all there's no flashy. end to it. <laughs> But well, we no love our stories, it. right? We love our stories. We love, we love describing it. We love narrating it. We love our heroes and our villains. We, I mean, right. we love uh, stories. We really do. But uh, you start to realize it's all kind of a story. Like it's, we're all just kind of agreeing that the, you know, apple means this red thing that you know, and then we think we know. It. We limit it to this word. And we have ideas about it, right? But that's not what the, you know, and especially God, which, you know, is, you know, even less concrete than, or well, that's debatable. I guess that gets we won't get into that, but you get the the, the idea. Yes, indeed, we get the idea, and and uh, you know, all of that thinking is troublemaking. Well, I'm going to be a troublemaker and go back to the previous poem. I just had an idea. Uh -huh. um, you know, where she says, look how the sky takes the fields and the oceans and our bodies in its arms and moves all his being towards his lips. And then immediately God must get hungry for us. Because when we want to eat something, we do take it near the lips. So there is where I think it's the, the unity, like God really wants us, everybody to become one with him. But then because of the dance, uh, she says, well, why can't he be a lover and just want us near rather than be one? So again, the, the, the usefulness or the beauty of di di uh, duality. Mm. Well, I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, and that is read something of my own here because it is so uh, right on this poem. The title is, I Don't Know Nothing. I don't know nothing, that's a fact, since nothing can't be known. One with Scrooge on Christmas morn, I do not add and can't subtract from nothing. Yet something's known is also true, and the knower is this heart. Heart is one, though it seems a part reveals to me that there is two of something. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing, that's a fact, since nothing can't be known. 
one with Scrooge on Christmas morn. I do not add and can't subtract from nothing. Yet something's known is also true. And the knower is this heart. Heart is one, though it seems a part reveals to me that there is two of something. So that's me being a troublemaker. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yes, we, we know and we don't know at the same time. And it is so paradoxical. Those who think they do are just troublemakers. So anything else from anyone about this poem? Okay. Uh, Swayam, would you read this choir? Um, sure. This choir. So amazing, this choir of socks, shoes, shirt, skirt, undergarments, earth, sky, suns, and moons. No wonder I too now sing all day. <laughs> <laughs> this choir, so amazing, this choir of socks, shoes, shirt, skirt, undergarments, earth, sky, suns, and moons. No wonder I too now sing all day. This poem is just too funny. <laughs> From yeah. shoes and socks all the way to earth and sky and moons. Well, it just... It just seems to me that she's saying that we're really we're really just at a loss to really describe the reality or we just all we can do is sing about it. All we can do is You know, what a way for Ladinsky to finish the, the, the section on Rabia. Yeah, I like his... Sorry, brother. Please go ahead, Jeffrey. I do like how he brings, or how she brings in the, um, the mundane things of like a sock and a shoe. Yeah. You know, sometimes we can think of beingness or God only in uh, trees and sky and moon, but they're there in the little speck of paper and a, you know, it's the, the it, it's still being, right? It's being a pen or a sock. And it's the, the shining forth of that beingness that really is the thing to sing about, that there's anything at all, right? That it is. Yeah. It's so amazing, this choir. The isness, right? Isness of socks and isness of earths and isness of skies and isness of thoughts and isness of uh, desire and isness. Uh, it's all ising, you know? And <laughs> it's all ising. I love it. And it's, it's included, right? I like that in this amazing choir, we have shoes and socks and, and chargers and, uh, you know, hairspray. You know, and it's all it's all ising so so beautifully, right? And when we and where we can even see beauty in just the way the brush is, you know, hitting the corner of the table. I'd never done that before. I'd never seen the brush just hit the corner of the table just so with the light right. coming in and cast you on my lap. And you know, it's it's all it's all there. It's it's a choir is a, a coming together of many, many, many 
many voices, right? Yes. And each unique, you know, but also together in its isness. It's all ising. Yes. <laughs> it's all ising. Anything else from anyone? <clears throat> okay. So amazing, this choir of socks, shoes, shirt, skirt, undergarments, earth, sky, suns, and moons. No wonder I, too, now sing all day. So amazing. Singing with amazement. Jeffrey, would you be so kind as to read us the, this little short a biography of St. Francis of Assisi? As long uh, as you don't hold it against me if I don't get some of these pronunciations correct. I, I have nothing to hold against you. Okay, I will try my best. St. Francis of Assisi? Uh, no one lives outside the walls of this sacred place, existence. Francis Bernadon, 1182 to 1226, is the most beloved saint of the Western world. His love for nature and his hymns to the sun, moon, earth, and birds have captured the hearts of millions of Catholics and the respect of millions of people of all faiths. This saint achieved the highest state of consciousness possible to man, a divine union with God. Francis was born in 1182 in Assisi in central Italy into the family of a wealthy linen merchant, Pietro di Bernadan. In his youth, he enjoyed all the privileges of such a station in life and was said to have especially loved parties. The end of the 12th century was a time of political turmoil, and as Francis grew to manhood, he began to embrace the ideals of medieval chivalry as depicted in the troubadour's songs, influencing him to seek a military career as a knight. He was captured and imprisoned after his first battle between Assisi in Perugia, and returned home a year later very ill. Recovered, he determined to enlist again, this time fighting for the Pope and the Crusades. The Crusades uh, brought Francis to the Middle East, and there are accounts that St. Francis was in contact with Rumi's master, Shams, while Francis was in Damascus. Francis had many visions in his life, and it was around this time that one of these visions made him realize a military career was not for him. He returned home and began a new life on fire with love for God. He began to devote himself to helping the impoverished and the afflicted. It is said that he embraced and kissed a leper and experienced a baptism of joy and triumph over fear. There are many wonderful accounts of St. Francis. When he was about 25, he would often pray in secluded spots. Once, while in an old country chapel, the painted figure of Christ on the crucifix spoke to him saying, Francis, go and repair my house, which as you see, is falling completely to ruin. Thus, his destiny began to unfold. Another story that may be unfamiliar to some readers is that sometimes when Francis was traveling with his brother monks, he would pick up a stick and pretend it was a violin bow, and his arm a violin, and he would start playing the violin and singing French songs that his mother had taught him as a child. Francis would leap about and dance and become ecstatic. It is said of Francis that his love for God at times made him so wild that few understood him. In many churches around the world, one of the happiest Sundays is St. Francis Day, when people bring their animals to the church to be blessed. 
St. Francis's life was a great blessing to all. His spiritual beauty, power, and compassion will always offer us guidance. Okay, please read it again. Uh, you know, there's so much there. Uh, I think we can benefit from hearing it read again. As St. Francis of Assisi, no one lives outside the walls of this sacred place, existence. Francis Bernadon, Francis Bernadon, <laughs> Francis Bernadon, 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 is the most beloved saint of the Western world. His love for nature and his hymns to the sun, moon, earth, and birds have captured the hearts of millions of Catholics and the respect of millions of people of all faiths. This saint achieved the highest state of consciousness possible to man, a divine union with God. Francis was born in 1182 in Assisi in central Italy into the family of a wealthy linen merchant, Pietro de Bernardin. In his youth, he enjoyed all the privileges of such a station in life and was said to have especially loved parties. The end of the 12th century was a time of political turmoil and as Francis grew to manhood, he began to embrace the ideals of medieval chivalry as depicted in the troubadour songs influencing him to seek a military career as a knight. He was captured and imprisoned after his first battle between Assisi and Perugia and returned home a year later, very ill. Recovered, he determined to enlist again, this time fighting for the Pope and the Crusades. The Crusades brought Francis to the Middle East and there are accounts that St. Francis was in contact with Rumi's master Shams while Francis was in Damascus. Francis had many visions in his life and it was around this time that one of these visions made him realize a military career was not for him. He returned home and began a new life on fire with love for God. He began to devote himself to helping the impoverished and the afflicted. And it is said that he embraced and kissed a leper and experienced a baptism of joy and triumph over fear. There are many wonderful accounts of St. Francis. When he was about 25, he would often pray in secluded spots. Once, while in an old country chapel, the painted figure of Christ on the crucifix spoke to him, saying, Francis, go and repair my house, which, as you see, is falling completely to ruin. Thus, his destiny began to unfold. Another story that may be unfamiliar to some readers is that sometimes when Francis was traveling with his brother monks, he would pick up a stick and pretend it was a violin bow and his arm a violin and he would start playing the violin and singing French songs that his mother had taught him as a child. Francis would leap about and dance and become ecstatic. It is said of Francis that his love for God at times made him so wild that few understood him. In many churches around the world, one of the happiest Sundays is St. Francis Day, when people bring their animals to the church to be blessed. St. Francis's life was a great blessing to all. His spiritual beauty, power, and compassion will always offer us guidance. Anything at all from anyone about this narrative of this very brief narrative of St. Francis's life. Well, I love his sense of playfulness. Yes. You know, I think that's so important, you know, that he, he loved parties and he, you know, that you can, you can have this love for, for God and, and still have a good time, right? He, he would often dance and he would get so ecstatic so ecstatic that people couldn't understand what he was saying. He was just so uh, immersed. Yes, he was lost in the divine. And he is revered. For example, here nearby, within just a few miles of this place, there's a, a Mexican takeout place. It's called San Pancho's. 
San Pancho is the affectionate name for St. Francis in a part of central Baja California. In that particular, for, for some reason, he has become known as San, San Pancho. Pancho is an affectionate term for somebody who is a, a good companion. So San Pancho. Anything else from anyone about this story of St. Francis's life? Thank you, Jeffrey. Is that Mexican restaurant any good? <laughs> it's, it's the best one I've found. Is it? Where then, is that? Oh, it's, uh, if you know where the Home Depot is yeah. on Lawrenceville Highway, just before you go into Gwinnett County. Yes. Uh, it, there, there's a, a restaurant that's more well known there called La Thai. Oh, I know just where that is. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's in that same strip mall. Okay. And uh, of course, my particular affection for it uh, has to do with the fact that I spent 50 years in Southern California, where the Mexican food is largely uh, uh, that Mexican food eaten by the ordinary people of Baja California, not the Mexico further south and to the east. Mm. So that's why I like San Pancho so much. But it's, everything is also made fresh right there. There's no, it's not a chain. There's not a, Check it out. Yeah. Anyway. Well, I think it's just, you know, remarkable how he was a knight in the military and then he got, you know, a vision or whatever and he just went from being a knight to being a monk. You know, that's quite a transformation. Yes. As a matter of fact, that church that uh, where Christ spoke to him from the crucifix, that was the genesis of his order, the order of St. Francis, uh, the Franciscans. Uh, he gathered a bunch of young, in those days it was all men. <clears throat> Later, his sister Claire uh, started an order of nuns as well. But uh, in the beginning, he gathered a bunch of young men to help him restore that church. And there ended up being a dozen of them, himself and 11 others. And they decided, he decided, along with them, that they should become an order of monks. And so he took a petition to Rome uh, to get the Pope's blessing on starting a new order, which was not an easy thing in those days. Um, this was the 13th century or something, I don't know. Well, I forget what the dates are. Maybe it was the, what, what were the dates of his birth and death? 12? 1182 to 1236. Yeah, so it was, 12, it, was it was the 13th century, 12 something. At 1226. <laughs> Right, when he went to Rome, and uh, you know, that was a time of real turmoil in the church, and so he had to wait some time to get an audience with the Pope. But then the Pope had a vision himself, and this was not a Pope that was so much given to visions. Anyway, he had a vision, and uh, the, in the vision he was said, you know, grant Francis's wish. And um, so the Franciscans were formed. And uh, from that dozen now, of course, there, at, at its height, there were thousands of Franciscan monks. And his sister, as I said, Claire, he was very close to his sister. Um, they loved one another dearly.
and she started an order of nuns. The poor Claire's. And it's interesting, he was in contact with um, Rumi's master, Shams, while he yes. was in Damascus. I, I find that interesting. Well, this is, this is uh, very controversial. Some people say it isn't true. You know, uh, Ladinsky believed it enough, there was enough evidence to include it. But uh, not everyone believes it's true. Um, what? What do we know? Uh, Liam, are you there with the book? Hey, Brother Shankar, I, I unfortunately I don't have my book with me at this moment. Okay. Uh, then, um, um, Brother Shankar, it is yes. eight thirty. Oh, is it eight thirty? My goodness. Yes. Doesn't time fly when you're having fun? All right, well, we'll leave it there and read the first poem next week then. Thank you for being attentive. <laughs> being a storyteller by nature and by trade, I completely lose track of time. So we'll close it with that. St. Francis was indeed, I don't know if you've ever been to one of those days at a Catholic church when people bring their animals, but uh, in Mexico and in Southern California, they'll even bring horses and cows right into the church. Awesome. Even though they may poop on the floor poop or pee on the floor. They'll bring them right into the church for the, for the blessing. Mm -hmm. And of course, people bring their dogs and cats and birds and all that kind of thing. And uh, it's really lovely. It's really lovely. Because they're sprinkled with the holy water, the animals are. And the priest says a, a blessing. It used to be in Latin, now it's in English. And uh, blesses the animal. Uh, it's it is, it's a sweet thing, and it's said that Saint Francis, because of his, because of his omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence was able to speak to any animal or bird. There's a lovely poem in here about him having a conversation with a squirrel. <clears throat> but he, he talked with the birds, he talked with the plants. There's a poem in here about a plant whistling at him <laughs> to get his attention. So. Anything else from anyone? All right, tears. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. And may we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as we understand her or him. Anything else from anyone? All right, dears. Thank you. Thank you. So next, Thank next, you. next week we'll read Because He Gave Birth. Okay, good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.